All right, welcome again to Social Distillation, the submarine still of the internet, where we attempt to drop the bead and pour white lightning straight onto your brain. What are we talking about today, Samo? Uh, well, we've got uh, our main thing is we wanted to go over some interviews because uh, the somebody we've been talking about lately, RFK Jr., has been hitting the podcast rounds, and it's kind of his only exposure other than yeah. you ne- ad hominem attacks from the media, uh, which is something that could be curious. And then I probably uh, think we can pivot because of the second thing you wanted to talk about. Uh, I actually had some uh, Pride Month stuff that I wanted to go over. And I think you would segue that into that with the second thing you want yeah. to talk about. So, yeah, the, um, I don't know about you, but every once in a while, I, I kind of step back from myself and look at myself and go, my gosh, how did we get here? Because not that long ago, um, if you would have said, there are, there are quite of the few pundit type people that I listen to have said there's no way RFK can be the nominee because they won't let him. They'll take him out first. Oh, and they many, don't necessarily many, many mean yeah. yeah. And they don't necessarily mean the way they took out Bernie. Um well let me let me go over one thing uh before we get into it because it's related and it kind of actually sets a backdrop to it because there's so many powers that be that won't let it happen. And one of them is our uh esteemed fbi Mm -hmm. uh but uh we actually had comments on the last social video too uh the whole thing smells like month old fish yep and the documents are properly stored in boxes and locker room houses protected by the secret surface or documents stored in joe's car so yeah we've got the obvious double let's be fair it wasn't in his car it was in his garage next to his car car. it did say next to his car yeah it did say next to his car but uh one of the things we talked about is i brought up the homeland security and you were surprised that i said that on the list of examples of white supremacy was uh kyle rittenhouse so i found the document again and uh here it is right here item number 10 on August 20, in August 2020, a ju- juvenile armed with a semi-automatic rifle had heated the online co- call posted by a self-proclaimed militia group on Facebook to confront protesters in Kenosha, Wisconsin. He allegedly shot and killed two protesters and wounded a third. After the shootings, local police officers waved the alleged murderer through the lines, even after bystanders identified him as the shooter. The armed juvenile then traveled across state lines, remember those lines again, uh, to his home. Uh who is that other than Kyle Rittenhouse? Uh, but then I started diving further into this document. The one above it here, that one uh, looks pretty bad. Assassination attempt against the law enforcement. So I looked up the actual case and uh, here's our white supremacist. Black face of white supremacy is real. Well, except that if you dig into the whole story, he apparently was... Uh, spent a lot of time in jail for aggravated assault and robbery and dr- uh, drug possession and dealing. And when he got out, he decided to fix his life and was trying to reunite with his teenage son. And uh, his teenage son was playing with a gun with his friends and shot himself on accident and killed himself. And uh, the, he, the, this, this man apparently dove back into the drug life again and, uh, basically blames the cops that weren't doing their job in protecting the city for his kid's death and went down a down, downward spiral, went on a bender and got a hold of a gun and decided to, this is, this is a, this is a crime of passion. I, anybody who has a child knows that it's not just a bam, bam, mm-hmm. you know, bang, bang play. It, this, this is something that's been festering and smoldering in his mind and been uh, helped by drugs along the way. This guy needed help. This guy wasn't a domestic terrorist. This guy just blamed the wrong people for his son's death. And anybody, again, anybody who's a father knows that that's going to throw you into a, a fit of rage if, if you're not careful. This is not a domestic terrorist. And it, this, this is definitely not a white supremacist dom- domestic terrorist. So I go up and I wanted to look for definitions. And first of all, exhibit A was an op-ed about white supremacy. So there's your government at work investigating things. But what we got is the this report here 
is where they get their definitions. And this is page 33 to get what actually constitutes being a far, far right violent extremist. Nationalistic, as opposed to universal and intention, international in orientation. What the hell does that mean? Yeah. Anti-global. That sounds the same to me. Anti-global. So if I criticize the WEF, does that put me in this category? Yes, it does. If I say America first or make America great again, hmm, what what group of people were doing that for mm-hmm. a while? You are now officially far right violent extremists by definition, I, by their own definitions. I love the third one because conservatives have been saying for decades that the left hates the founding of the country. And there you go. Yep, suspicious of centralized authority. And this comes on the tail end of this last week, Merrick Garland saying, if you question our uh, our department, then you are questioning democracy. Mm-hmm. You, it, it was the law enforcement version of Fauci's I am the science. It, it is it is the same mentality of the uh, that the FBI whistleblower on Bet David was talking about, that that chilling line of. He said, uh, I, we, I can't do this. I took an oath to the Constitution. Your loyalty to the FBI comes first, is what he was told. It's the same mentality. Reverent of individual liberty. Every real liberal. keep you know, Conservatives is one thing. We know they've been targeted. Liberals, you're targeted. Mm-hmm. You want free speech? You are now a white supremacist or right extremist. Well, and this this is one of the places where especially to to. Yeah. If you if you actually agree with the Constitution, you're a far right extremist. This is one of the places where I thought uh, RFK Jr. Did really well in his interview with Peterson is he he brought this up uh, and he mentioned specifically uh, reference the ACLU, which used to be a a individual rights uh and they were they were they were left-leaning liberals in their view of what that meant but they went so far as to as a uh there there is a famous made it all the way to the supreme court trial uh for in skokie illinois or indiana illinois i think where the aclu defended the kkk's right to march neo-nazis they were the KKK. Okay. They were fully hooded. Yeah, he called them neo Nazis, which by that point in the 60s, there had been a lot of crossover there. Um, and he brought up uh, details that I'd forgotten about, uh, specifically that it was through a predominantly Jewish neighborhood. It was why they were doing it and why they were doing it there. And as offensive as that is, it's still a free country and they have the right to freely associate. And they have the right to demonstrate peacefully. And we have the right to think they're disgusting human beings. Belief in a conspiracy theories that involve a grave threat to national sovereignty or personal liberty. So things like uh, the government is colluding with Twitter to take away my free speech. Or the FBI is cracking down on parents that want access to uh, you know, school board meetings. That, that would qualify under those two. And yes, they're real. They're not conspiracy theories. But it makes you a far-right violent extremist. Under their own definition, this is their own document, goa.gov, right here. Belief that one's personal or national way of life is under attack and is either already lost or that the threat is imminent. Well, all of these things lead to that one. Put a pin in that one because that one actually ties into the LGBTQ plus stuff I'm going to talk about when we get to that. Belief in the need to be prepared for an attack, either by participating in or supporting the need for paramilitary uh, preparations and training or survivalism. So being part of a militia group. And this is important because look at the way that they are you demonizing a word so it becomes a bad word. Militia is now a bad word, but if you read the mm-hmm. Constitution, mm-hmm. it was a necessary thing for the country. And the people who are doing this are actually constitutionalists. They're not far right, far right extremists. I can't remember his name, 
but I, I looked into it after I heard um, a couple months ago, uh, Glenn Beck's um, Saturday podcast, which is a long form interview, was with Tim Kennedy. And and Kennedy mentions a story I'd never heard of before, which was a, a former SF guy um, who had put together this network of um, support and education for what some might call survivalism. Uh, and it was it was um, it was not a militia. Uh, it was uh a lot of it was focused on natural disasters, breakdown in services. I mean, there was some of it of, you know, what do you do when emergency services break down in Portland, Oregon or Kenosha, Wisconsin, because Antifa is going nuts. So there was an element of that. And it did include things like self-defense and proper firearm training. Um, hello. As we're talking, we're, like I said, we're leading to, to RFK. We talked about things might happen. <laughs> death of federal whistleblower officially ruled a suicide found in his car with a gun and a bullet wound the the there was a suicide note in his hand the gun was his and he gave away his plants the day before yeah if you threaten to kill my son and my wife and my closest friends and family i'll write a suicide note and off myself too to save them this this is this is the world we live in guys 54 I, people you're associated with do not commit suicide. So Hillary Socrates Clinton. committed suicide because yeah, he was told, here, drink yeah. this hemlock or else. Yeah. Well, but also he was told you can leave or you can stay for your trial. And he stayed. That's committing suicide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he, he knew it was rigged. He, mm -hmm. he absolutely knew that it was rigged. Um, what was I saying? Oh, so then the FBI basically ruined this guy's life. They they target here is a guy who served his country for I don't remember how long, and uh, I think it may have been the full twenty because I I, I I seem to recall Tim Kennedy saying that he lost his pension. Um, that is disgusting. That is obscene. That is frankly evil. And so th this was the point I was making. What I was getting to is not that long ago I said that's silly. Be quiet. You're 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 disrupting things. You're not helping the conversation when you say somebody's going to take out RFK Jr. rather than let him be elected president or even become the nominee. It sounds perfectly plausible to me now. Well, takeout takes on many forms. They're going to try the mm -hmm. Time Magazine perfectly legal cabal route before they try anything else. Fortifying uh, the election. Yeah. So so the, the whole anti-vaxxer you know, the conspiracy theorist uh, candidate is going to be the play for now. But here's the thing. If something happens to Biden because he's old and he's not moving around very well, there is nobody that can jump into this race th that would be able to even come close to overtaking RFK right now. And at that point, uh, you would see someone like Gavin Newsom step in, who's probably the person who could come the closest Mm -hmm. and then something might happen to Kennedy because even coming coming the closest, coming in this late would still be difficult. Although you got to give him credit. Newsom is, he, he's got that Obama orator to him. He, he can, he can lead you to believe that he is a, he is, he's the man for the presidential job, even though we have a nice track record of California being California over the last couple of years. But he's he's a slick car salesman, is what he is. Without seeming like he's a car salesman. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the thing. Uh, and uh, the last one on there, I'm not not going to bring up the story, but there's apparently the uh, whistleblower in the tax uh, issues with Hunter Biden that came up missing these last couple of days too. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, so we've got that going on. But on to RFK. I wanted to lay the backdrop because there are people that, oh, here's a, here's another example. Jake Tapper was just asked if he would ever host a town hall, CNN's Jake Tapper with RFK. And in his tirade of hell no, was it a very vague personal experience that no one else was witness to where he said RFK lied to him like 10 times. Uh, 
but no one else was around. So it's my, it's, it's my truth. Uh, and the anti-vaxxer conspiracy theorist, dangerous information, the dangerous information. So we won't even have him on. And in that tirade, he said, and his false alle allegations about pharmaceutical money controlling the news. There is the problem. What I what did I tell you the, the last time that we talked about RFK was his going to be his first action as a president. Executive order banning pharmaceutical ads on mm -hmm. television. And, and, and that is a great example of where left and right should be able to come together because I thought that that was legislation. And he said, no, that was an FDA regulatory change mm -hmm. back in 2000, whatever it was. I thought it was FCC, that. but. FCC? Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. FCC. Yeah, because he, I think that's what he brought up, said, I'll do the executive order, but he does, does want to go through the actual process of getting. Because it. that is something that should be done through our representatives, one, and two, that way it can't immediately be undone by his successor. Yeah, but it can't. I mean, the thing about this is this also makes this this cycle so much more important because through our representatives means a lot of a lot of are a lot of representatives in the pocket book yeah. of the same people mm -hmm. because we allow anybody who says, "Oh, we're not a fascist state." Realistically, we're a fascist state as soon as we allowed lobbying. It, it's, it's corporate government collusion to be able to pay a politician to vote the way you want them to vote. Mm -hmm. Um, I've heard several people float this idea and I really like it. Um, why is the house of representatives so small? Because I don't remember when it was done, but the number of representatives was capped. So that's why there's always a big fight every 10 years with the census is because those representatives get shifted around based on population. Okay. Why did we cap the number of representatives? We should have capped the number of citizens to representative so that the number of representatives would grow as the population grows. If you just doubled the number of representatives, that would make lobbying a lot more difficult because you have a lot more people you have to buy off. Yeah, except except here's what here's the problem with that. Some somewhere somewhere uh, place like LA County or Harris County or Bear County mm -hmm. is going to end up with a lot more representatives. Mm -hmm. So the urban, the urban areas would just take over. It's just like the popular vote in the electoral college. It's got to be capped would, or else the, would, the urban centers would take over. If it's but population it would still based. be the, the whole point of the bicameral legislature is that the two senators per state, no matter population is what balances the popular representation and it's why the popular representation is every two years and the balanced representation is every six to keep that balance. And yes, the urban centers, their population in the House of Representatives would boom, but there's also a huge disparity in urban centers between, you know, red and blue and purple voting blocks. So there still would be. Uh, a lot of give and take. The other thing it would do is it would make it easier for, you know, you talked about your your state rep came and knocked on your door when you moved in. No, if, he's he's our he's our house. Oh, he's he's okay. the U.S. House representative. Yeah, that's I I assumed it was state because that's so rare. Because again, there's only 435 of them, and that means that in urban areas there's a lot of people that they're they're representing and if you if you shrunk that number then it would make them more accountable to their actual voters because it would be easier for the voters and and every vote would count more um it's it's why the football season is so much more exciting than the baseball season because there's like, a hundred game counts yeah yeah you're you got 162 games so every, every you, once in a while, you got a cushion. You can drop the last game and sit your starters, you know? Yeah. But, but in, in football, there are so many, you know, there's almost well, 17 now, which I think is silly, but only 17 games. Well, it was supposed to make tie, ties less likely mm -hmm. have an odd number of games. 
but because they changed the overtime rules that make ties more likely, we still have, it, yes. it ends up making season ties more likely if you have in-game ties more likely. Yeah. I, I just think here's, here's, here's what I think. They talk about player safety. Okay. Let's, let's, let's do it the way you have it for player safety where it's a limited time. But then at the end, the kickers have a kickoff first one to miss loses. And then kickers will start going in the first round of the draft too. Uh, I can, I can hear the, the, I can hear the anti-soccer people screaming or even anti-hockey. A lot of people, that's why they don't like hockey is the, the shoot. So many games come down to a shootout instead of the game. All right. Anyway, or, or play it, about? play it like a big capture the flag game. Have your, have your kick returners on either side with like five linemen and the first one to score wins, you know, just all out scrum. Especially what the XFL did when they first started, and that was silly. Of course, that would, that, the that would increase the injury. That would increase the injury rate, but yeah. it would be fun. It would be so fun. That person gets a, a ten thousand dollar bonus for making the touchdown. There, there, they'll they'll take the injury risk. We should, why can't we just talk about football all day? Politics is stupid. <laughs> when I was coming back from, we're my talking Cairo, about the politics of football. <laughs> yeah, when I when I was coming back from my Cairo appointment. They were reading an article from The Athletic talking about how the best offseason move, not just for the Cowboys, but for the division, was getting Brandon Cooks. And I was thinking... Which we were so happy to get rid of. (laughs) You were so happy to get rid of him, I didn't realize not only was it only a fifth and sixth round pick, but the Texans are still paying six million of his 18 million guaranteed. Uh, Yeah, and our dead cap is 16 million, I think, somewhere around there. He He's our last... Big dead cap hit from the Bill O'Brien era. So yeah. w- once we got rid of him, he didn't want to play. So he he was going to be a, a a tool in the locker yep. room. We're gonna we're gonna have the cap hit no matter what. So might as well get Robert Woods in, someone who's a who, who's a team player. He's a great guy in the locker room. We got your guy Schultz to be a, a solid tight end. Mm-hmm. Got some good young receivers. That not a lot of money either. It was it yeah. made my eyebrows go up. And we go. still got enough cap room that we might be the team that Hopkins lands back in. And so. Uh, he he's he's looking for a, a well. He primarily left because of the front office, right? Yeah, and we got a completely new front office. So, uh, but I think it was with the owner ownership, though. Mm. But uh, but at the same time, if he comes back and is humble in coming back, I'm great to give a guy an, another chance, especially in a young with a young quarterback. We've got a great run game. Our our line seems to be shored up for the first time in ten years. Uh, it's you know, sky's the limit if someone like that comes back in and we got the cap room, spend all your cap money. If you want to win, that's my thing. Don't leave cap money on the table. If you really want to win, mm-hmm. get all the talent you can, but back to politics, you want you know, to that... specifically talk about RFK on Peterson, but I've, uh-huh. I've probably listened to about 15 hours of RFK interviews and including, he just had his speeches in town halls. Well, that's good because there was a big red flag for me Mm -hmm. in that in that interview. And I'm curious what your take on it was, having listened to him in other settings. The big red flag for me was when Peterson was trying to pin him down on when does the left go too far? Yes. And he he was seemed unprepared for that one. And I don't know. I don't know if he just didn't understand the way Peterson was asking it. Mm-hmm. But but at the same time, yeah, it's it seemed like he kind of fumbled that one out of the gate, but then they kind of got back on track uh, for a while. Yeah, that one was really disconcerting to me because it. But he answers that um, question very well in his interview with Bill Maher. OK, yeah. I hadn't I, I hadn't listened to that one. Uh, is that one still on you? Did I see that one on YouTube? Yeah, it's on uh, Mars actual podcast station, not on uh, his oh, okay. his televised uh, uh, what would you yeah, call it? syndicated? It, yeah, it wasn't politically incorrect. It was something I hadn't heard of before. I didn't know he had a podcast that he was doing. It's called yeah, uh, it, it's just shooting shit called. in his basement while he smokes weed and the guests do whatever they want. Uh, what was it called? But there were the the analogy I thought of when I was trying to explain why I didn't like this is um. There were major red flags in 2015-16 for Trump. It's why so many, especially traditional conservatives, said, 
I don't Club care if random. he's the nominee. Club random. Club random. I don't care if he's the nominee. I'm a conservative, not a Republican, and he's not a conservative. Now he got he then got into office and did a lot of things that conservatives liked. So they said, Oh, well, I guess we were wrong about these things. Turned out I don't think not so much wrong. So they supported him in 2020, also because the left had gone insane. Um, more insane. But one of the big red flags was um, oh, what's his name? He's so irrelevant. David Duke. You may have heard that he's one of the few uh like actual neo Nazis out there. I don't think he calls himself that or white supremacist. You know, I don't know what he labels himself as, but uh he is someone that is attached to the right, but the right has never claimed him and always ridiculed him, and his his influence is tiny. Okay. And uh Trump got asked about it in the primary. I want to say because he's he's in South Carolina. And so it was in the lead up to that primary. And this was when Trump was still, you know, things were still kind of rocky. Because remember, uh, Cruz won Iowa, and I believe Trump came in third. And I don't remember who won New Hampshire, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't Trump. And so South Carolina was a big deal because that was the third primary. And a, in a fairly important swing state and he beat around the bush you know it it was obviously a trap question because it's the media trying to associate the republican party with white supremacists even though you know robert bird was literally a recruiter for the kkk but i digress but he could have he could have been combative he could have answered it directly and he could have slapped it down but instead he beat around the bush and the the inference was Trump Trump thinks these are who the South Carolina voters are, and he's more afraid of losing support in the primary than slapping down someone who needs to be slapped down. And that's how RFK's response came across to me. Is I I don't want to get too specific here because I don't want to alienate any potential voters. I'm hoping it was just he wasn't expecting the question and wasn't quite sure with how Peterson was phrasing the question. Mm-hmm. But well, they went back and but forth there's for so a many, while. On there's it. so many places that that could be relevant. Mm-hmm. You know, when does the left go too far? Okay, uh, banning all fossil fuels. That's a place that it could go too far. So he, he probably was working through his head. What does he? I'm known for my environmental stuff, but this is the da, da, da. when. Peterson, it was so vague because you can lump so many of those things that it does go so far. The 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 forced speech, the the pronouns, the 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 abortions even after birth, the you know, all of these different issues can be in that category. Where when he yeah. was on when he was on Club Random, Mar just starts talking about those things. And he just spits out his his view on those things. And that's like, that's a good point. It may just be that he doesn't necessarily look at things in the broad philosophical terms which is where mm-hmm. peterson comes from in all of this yeah when, when you say D- when does it go too far and you're like uh communism i guess you know it's, that's too far but there's a there's a lot of gray area between uh what we have now and communism mm-hmm. that that we're still going down that path right which which was which is peterson's point that he's been making for a while because he he brought this up years ago was equity is when the left goes too far because it is a distortion of their you know purported idea of of fairness and of equality is equity uh and, and as he said the people who are using this phrase do not mean uh op, uh uh equal opportunity and this is there was a clip of sanders with this recently I was with say, Mar, except for bernie sanders and, <laughs> and, and 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 bernie was like oh i don't know oh, i don't know and, yeah, then I guess. When, when, and then when Mar explained it, he goes, well, I mean, equal opportunity. Yeah, yeah. So it it is possible, if not probable, that the talking heads are just talking heads and all they care about is their elections and power and they don't actually know what's going on. And if RFK comes from a very different world than Peterson and the people Peterson have been talking to. Mm-hmm. So when he talks about this difference between equality and equity, I know exactly what he's talking about because – I've been paying attention to DEI and CRT before that. And well, which, which is funny because 
this is this is an interesting kind of dynamic because I just watched two hours of Vivek Ramaswamy on uh, Dark Horse as well, mm-hmm. and it you said you said it's a different world, and yes, Kennedy is coming at this from a different world. He understands the root of the problem without the 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 kind of the uh, the slang the vernacular mm-hmm. that we use as 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 uh, regular people kennedy's not a regular if you got the last name kennedy you're you're not a regular person right uh, you know uh as far as rubbing elbows with the hoi polloi you know he's he's up there whereas vivek worked himself up from being a biomechanist or something like that to be one of, one of the most successful business people in the country uh and they're going at the exact same thing corporate collusion with government and all this DEI, CEI scores, everything, mm-hmm. all of it comes down to the con- dividing the public so you don't see the corporate collusion that's going on that's actually increasing the income gap and the elitist yes. versus the plebs. And they're coming at the exact same problem exactly the same way with a whole different language. It- and this is where, and I kind of teased this, I think, last time, or I know when we were talking about what we were going to talk about I might actually, I, I looked up, you, you need to look up what uh, Ballotopedia is where I went. Um, there's also. I, I have a second. Ballotopedia up. Hold on. For, here, I found an, I found another one here. Uh, let me send you this link. I have it up for uh, Texas election uh, laws. And and what you're looking for is, is your primary closed, which means you have to be registered in that party and you can only vote in that party. Semi-open, which is. If you are registered for that party or non-affiliated, you can vote. So Republicans can vote in the Republican primary and independents can choose do they vote Republican or Democrat primary. Open means anyone can vote anywhere. And you're supposed to sign a pledge that says you're not going to vote in both primaries. But Mm -hmm. they don't really enforce that. And I feel like they should. It it should happen at the same time. It should be which ballot do you they want? They enforce it here because you got to have your ID and everything. We got the ID laws and everything down here. Yeah, but I mean, as far as voting in both primaries, it should be all right. Which ballot do you want? You get one. Well, that's okay. what that's what they do here because that's what I I had to do last. So time. the the link I sent you, uh, is not only this is this is what you sent me up here. Yeah, it it may be taking a while for your poor laptop to load, but that there's a there's a table there that lists the whole schedule um no not that stuff uh there's a table that lists the whole schedule so you'll see when your state votes and then it says is it open closed or um semi Uh this is what you Uh sent me well why is it not loading the table that i'm looking at right here because you bring up your screen it's only videos that we need to put on mine because yeah, that's true. All right. Let me whip it out. Excuse me while I whip this out. Depends on if it's or. All right. So here is this table that want to load for you for some reason. Um, so it has I've the schedule. Like, I've got like 30 tabs open. So that might be that's true. true. So. Texas is Super Tuesday, which is a Tuesday when a gazillion states hold their primary all at the same time, Um, which is sooner than I thought it was. I thought there were more primaries before Texas. Um, Yeah, Texas is is March 5th, uh, and then it has the type of open, so completely open, or it'll say mixed if it's semi. Uh, So you can you can find your state. And you can find out because if because if it is closed, that that is what I was looking up is if I think I want to vote for RFK, then I have to change my registration either to Democrat or independent, depending on closed or uh, mixed. Um, but you also have to do it within a certain amount of time. Um, most places aren't that way with the general. In fact, some places will let you cast a prov- provisional ballot if you register the same day uh, at, as voting, which I have problems with as well, but anyway. Um, but for primaries, you usually have to register a certain amount of time, like 30 or 60 days ahead of time. So you're going to want to check that as well. 
Um, and the reason it matters is the delegate count. So, so one of the problems here is, is it's, it's showing the delegate count and that matters, but the, the delegates at stake in each state aren't as important as the split because almost all of the Republican primaries are winner takes all just like in the general election. The Democrats, the reason the Democrat primary can matter more and go on longer, and frankly, the reason Obama won the primary, it it's easy to look back as it was a fait accompli, but no, it was Hillary's turn, and she was supposed to win, except Obama kept hanging on and getting significant chunks of the vote. So he was building up more and more delegates, and she never pulled away. So until the super delegates threw their weight behind Obama and then, then it was over for Hillary. Uh, so if it looks like somebody is running away with it in the first half dozen primaries in the Republican side, because it's winner take all, it might be, well, there's no point in this. My vote doesn't matter, but your vote in the Democrat primary could matter. Mm -hmm. And RFK is attractive to me. For a couple of reasons one because if it's him who whether trump or desantis are really the only ones that have a chance on the republican side at least right now barring something happening even uh and i don't mean indictments because we've had two of those and trump is still way ahead in the polls um they're the only ones that really have a chance and either of those guys versus rfk we're going to have the debate we should be having because to, to well, your point, the thing about DeSantis is he's starting to become damaged goods with independent voters. And I don't I know you don't get as much of that news as I do just from the, the people we follow. But uh, because of his deep fake stuff and he's been actually doing a lot of false stories, false flag stuff, the his his new nickname, you know, Trump had tried a few nicknames for him that didn't work. But his new nickname is uh, Juicy, Juicy DeSantis or uh or Ron uh, Desmolet, so he's he's becoming the the hoax candidate uh, amongst independents and centrist. That's not good if you win the Republican nomination because yeah, you convinced the the hard right, but you're not going to pull as many of those independents as you think you do. You you think you want to? Where Trump can still pull a lot of independents. Yeah, it depends on the independence, though. But we can have the general election debate some other time. But it also depends but, on who who comes up on the left. If if it's yeah. Biden, then DeSantis actually probably wins. If it's someone like RFK, I don't think DeSantis can out debate RFK at all. If that would take, be an interesting debate, yeah. yeah if, if you take the voice, if you just just take the voice apart and just talk about context, I mean, RFK claimed. In uh, in his interview with Mar, I'm getting all these interviews mixed up. But in his interview with Mar, that he's the only candidate that can out debate Trump, and he might be right on that. No, I I I think so. Yeah, yeah. Um, certainly of anyone the Democrats are looking at, and it it remains to be seen of what's going to happen on the Republican side, which which is why DeSantis is still something of an unknown because. Right now, he looks attractive to most people like me who are more traditional conservatives, but he could get up on the debate stage and crap his pants. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen that happen with the way Trump is such a bully on that debate stage. But that, uh, that's the thing. Trump doesn't want to debate any of these other candidates, but that's his strength. Yeah. <laughs> and he's, he's throwing out his best weapon. Yeah. Um. Where was I? Brain. But, okay, but on the, so but on the on the on the blue side, everything could change depending on what happens with Biden in the next two years. Yes. Or year and a half. If he if his health continues to, to decline and he has to drop out or he's forced out for some reason, or he's just incoherent by that time to debate any to to that that even the general public is like, yeah, I can't do that. Then someone like Gavin Newsom will jump in. But Gavin's a company man. Oh, yeah. Gavin's biding his time. He'll he'll take another four years of Biden and then jump in on the tail end of that because he knows he'll beat the shit out of Kamala. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, 
She didn't win her own primary. She did not win the California primary. I don't think she was even close. I don't know if she broke double digits in the California primary. She she was, she was voting. She was voting less than uh, Chris Christie is voting is is polling right now. So uh, that so the, tells you the the reason I'm seriously considering voting in the Democratic primary for RFK is for for what you were just talking about in allaying my red flag fears is that he may not be able to understand it or articulate it on on the level I would like, you know, when I listen to someone like, uh, you know, like Peterson. Uh, but he, he gets it intuitively because he's lived it. The real problem, left and right, and why I've said before, I think a, a, a Federalist, a return of the Federalist Party, uh, with so much dissatisfactions with Republicans and Democrats could be a legitimate, viable third party because you could get a lot of people left, right, and middle who just think, look, we can disagree about how things should be run, but let's leave that to the state and local level. And on the federal level, let's get the federal government out of our business because right now it's far too much in our business. And I think I think I I heard him say this on uh, Jason Whitlock's. Um, he he did like a two hour special a while back on COVID and the vaccines, um, which may or may not still be on YouTube. I'm not sure, um, but RFK Jr. remembers the assassination of his uncle. He was old enough to remember it and remember that his father's first phone call was to the CIA desk, the, the CIA operative that ran the Bay of Pigs invasion. And as soon as he picked up, he said, did your people do this? Yeah, okay. I've heard him tell that story on somebody else's too. Yeah. So from the beginning, and he knew that the machine didn't want his father, you know, they didn't necessarily have anything to do with it like they might have with JFK's assassination, but they he knew that his the machine did not want his father to win that primary. Um, and then in his professional life, he's been dealing with the same thing because when he's dealing with environmental law, one of the things I like about him is he is not a, a partisan. He is not just it's evil corporations. No, it's the, it's the incompetent uh, bureaucracy of the federal government as well that you have to fight. You know, remember it was the EPA that had one of the, worst natural disasters in the world when it poisoned the Colorado River. Mm -hmm. I think people have forgotten that. That, happened, that. I don't remember how long ago that. I, it was like the end of Obama's term, I think, is when that happened. And it it was a disaster. And that was the EPA. Um, I brought up where the FDA, or well, I don't think they were the FDA at the time, poisoned people during Prohibition. They, they had poisonous alcohol, alcohol that was basically rubbing alcohol that would kill you if you drank it. And they knew it and they let it go out because, well, those people are breaking the law anyway. And then we'll know who's breaking the law because they'll be blind or dead. So he gets it intuitively. And for all of Trump's talk about the swamp, he never really did anything about the swamp. And the evidence for that is the last year of his presidency because the COVID bureaucracy ran the country into the ground and he let it happen. He stood by and let it happen. Mm hmm. Well, and that, that's where it would be an amazing debate because it would be a completely different debate between uh, RFK and Trump versus RFK and DeSantis because RFK would have Operation Warp Speed yep. to talk with Trump about. And the fact that the problem, one of the biggest problems with our medical industry is the fact that we turn a blind eye and fast track medications and the testing of those medications and then... Uh, the, the kind of bureaucracy that surrounds the fact that we don't even know what they're tested against, placebo controlled versus, you know, one of the things he talks about is almost every uh, vax on our schedule was never tested against the placebo. They were tested against other things like older versions of that vax. I or, was not aware of that. Yeah. And I was like, that sounds, but then Brett and Heather on their podcast went through a whole bunch of them and how and the actual testing processes that got their approval and she they were like we can't speak to all of them but these are the ones we figured out right here and it was actually fact checked to be at least mostly true 
And when you're injecting things in your body, mostly true is enough for me to say, Hey, let's yeah. look at this. And even, even still when people, everybody goes anti-vaxxer, anti-vaxxer about the autism stuff and everything, his final answer in every interview that anybody's pushed him on this on has been, it could be one of the many things that is going on. And what we need to do is start taking all of these possible, these hundred possibilities mm -hmm. and eliminating one at a time until mm -hmm. we get down to what are the causal factors, because we got those, we got environmental factors, we've got computer screens, we've got, you know, uh, it, people giving birth later in life. We've got all of these other things that could also be contributing. And the answer could be all of them. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a possibility. But we need to be doing this because it went from like one in 10,000 to one in 34 in my lifetime is what he's saying. And yeah, I'm, I'm not young, but mm -hmm. one person's lifetime is not a, a, a long time in the grand scheme of things. And yeah. that's huge. One in 10,000 ish to one in 34. That that's that's a massive change. Which. Whether or not you agree with his evaluation of the issue, the fact that he's able to have such a cohesive view, such a holistic view, and I mean that in the, in the whole total term, not the hippie holistic term, is good because that indicates how he thinks. He's not going to, you know, he, uh, which, what books do you have up there? He's, we were talking about Saul Alinsky last time. Oh, and I that's got, I got Fauci and Bargain because I figured okay. that was relevant. Yep. Uh, yep. We were going to talk the, the transgender stuff. So I've got end of gender, but also malignant. So Vinay Prasad's book on cancer research and how it's actually killing people. So that's relevant to what we're talking about. Uh, Desk Bound and Built to Move by Kelly Sturette. That's relevant because it's talking about environmental factors that are harmful. We've got things like sitting in chairs all day and not moving like we were designed to move as mm -hmm. human beings. Uh, so I think that can be added to the list. Yeah, those are the so, ones I have up. Yeah. We talked about this last time and I didn't actually whip it out. Where is it? Here we go. So Alinsky's rules for radicals. The entire point of one of, this one of the top 10 books i've ever read by the way the, the man it, was a freaking is, genius it is terrifying um well and, and and to some degree those principles can help a nobody become somebody mm -hmm. now that there are uh, the it, it, it's a tool it's a tool and just like any tool it can be used it's it's you know you can use a hammer to hammer in a nail or you can hit somebody in the head with a hammer the problem is we're the victims of being hit in the head with his work. Now, this is where my left and right brain fight with each other, because when I first started, you know, blogging rather than just ranting on Facebook, my conception was that, you know, I was one of those people that was all for anonymity on the Internet because it shouldn't matter who you are and where you come from, unless you're making a personal argument. If, if, if you're going to say, you know, if I'm going to say, this is, this is how you breach a defended location to rescue hostages. I'd better tell you, I know what the hell I'm talking about versus if Tim Kennedy's saying it, you know, then, you know, Oh, because he's done it right. Then the personal matters. If you're talking philosophy, politics, policy, general ideas, it shouldn't, matter it should be about the ideas however and this is where ben shapiro is wrong because you know not everyone is a robot like he is yes facts don't care about your feelings but your feelings don't care about the facts and and we are creatures of both we are creatures both of intellect and of emotion overlapping bell dis bell curves disclaimer mm -hmm. Overlapping bell curves disclaimer. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, we might talk about genetic testing and things i've learned about myself recently and then but yeah, that that make things make sense. Where this is, where these rules are scary, and part of my the left side of my brain thinks they're evil, but the right side of my brain understands. To your point of look, if you use these principles, it will help you craft a narrative, 
and focus in on what you're trying to say. But where the left, my left brain comes from is the entire point of all 13 of these rules is to short circuit your logic centers, to override them with emotion. And for all conservative media since Obama was running for president have been talking about Alinsky because he was linked to Alinsky. They have been very slow to recognize the Republicans do it too. Everyone it's, in power does it to some it's, extent because it's, all it's, about it's required points. to gain power. Exactly. It's all about yeah. talking points. It's all about the narrative. The narrative isn't just one side. Both sides want to craft a narrative and want to keep it simple stupid so they can reach the most people and convince the most people. And by convince, I don't mean persuade. I mean short circuit their logic centers, make them emotional so they run with you or run towards you rather than thinking and evaluating the options and the possibilities. Well, the, the big example we've talked about before is Colin Kaepernick. Mm -hmm. the, one of the big solid Alinsky points is the reaction is the point. It's what you do doesn't matter unless it elicits the reaction. So I can go up there and preach, you know, uh, systemic racism i can go up and preach systemic racism and i can have a bunch of facts in my favor and i will have very little effect but if i get the other side to react to something then it proves everything and i never have to say a word hmm. and that's that's my point that's one of the biggest things that started this channel is i want to fight against this whole the reaction is the point uh initiative just like we'll go back we'll keep this on to uh, topic RFK, if you label him an anti-vaxxer and you get people to believe that, or you say it enough times that people believe it, then they're not going to listen to a word he says because you the reaction is already there. You thinking about your kid with polio is a stronger emotional uh, effect than him talking about mercury and heavy metals in these vaccines that cause them to 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 elicit the immune response a little bit harder but then we're adding 72 to the to schedule instead of four like it used to be so now we're getting exposure after exposure after exposure and when his, he did his work with you know fish in the hudson and the mercury levels in that well it was coinciding with all of this and yeah that's a boring story unless you've got the patience to sit down for three hours on Joe Rogan. But Jake Tapper, all he has to say is better spreading dangerous inf information where your kid's going to end up with measles. That's quick to the point gets a reaction causes RFK to say, show me where I'm wrong and get in a defensive stance, which is the best thing about the Bill Maher interview because uh, well, let me stay on point. But he gets defensive at that point and he starts arguing the little bitty details and then everybody just kind of tunes out and he he's completely thrown off. And that's up until just here recently, that's been the case. Now in Bill Maher, Maher pushed him on some of those things. And when he started answering like that, he said, no, I'm going to stop you right here because that's the answer nobody wants to hear. He said, I know where you're coming from. I've listened to your long form stuff. Here's what you need to say. I am taking over as your campaign manager. <laughs> he said, he said, I want you to bring up your experience litigating these cases. I don't want you to start citing a study or asking who can prove me wrong or blah, blah, blah. I want you to go into a story about one of your litigations and how it, you know, it's the Aaron Brockovich, you know, kind of nobody connected this till somebody did kind of story. And I want you just to talk about that case and then never talk about the vax again in that. So you just talked about mercury and salmon mm -hmm. for, for 10 minutes. And then when he went in these town halls, those questions started coming and he did that and he closed. It was like, boom. Um, I was trying to find it and I, I couldn't find a good link, but when you talked about the reaction was the point um that 
that's a good example of of what you were you were talking about with Alinsky of how these tools can be used for good because Martin Luther King Jr. as a man there's a lot of issues there but you can dive into that history if you want but what he was was an organizer he wasn't the civil rights movement but he was able to bring together the various civil rights movements and one of the things that he did that he was very strict about very firm on is that if you are going to join with us in this march you know i you know i'm here with these people you come in with this group and this group comes in from over here he had a pledge of 10 principles that you must sign and swear on the bible that you would follow because where his genius was over other civil rights leaders is he knew that much like Uncle Tom's Cabin was the reason it was so impactful was because it was eye-opening to uh, the, the Northerners who didn't care because it showed the brutality of slavery uh, without censorship. And he knew that that's what it would take for civil rights is we need to show the rest of the country what is actually happening in the South and how we are actually treated and get white America on our side or we will not affect change. And he knew that would not happen if there were outbursts, if there was fighting back. Now, it wasn't just to provoke a reaction, but he knew it would provoke a reaction because he knew who – the racist cops and leaders of the segregation of South were. And so you had to sign this pledge because he knew and they knew what was coming. They they knew the dogs were going to be there. They knew the fire hoses were going to be brought out. And the pledge was, I walk in love. There was a lot of references to Jesus to it and to God and to the Bible. And, at, you know, as a reminder, this is why we're doing this. And this is our standard. Because he knew if if white America saw on the evening news all of that happening to people who were marching peacefully and who were not fighting back, the system would crumble. Mm -hmm. Well, which is a good testament to why Summer of Love didn't work. Because they marched like that and nobody did anything to stop them. And then they got bored and the ruffians stayed around till after dark and started doing bad things. Mm -hmm. Even before the ruffians did bad things, nobody stopped them. There was no resistance to the protest. There were no dogs leashed. There were no gas, you know, cans thrown. So the march was basically pointless because there was no reaction to it. And then the lack of reaction was evidence to the fact that they're marching against. The lack of reaction reflected the lack of what they're marching against. Mm -hmm. And that, 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 that showed that makes as big of a uh, statement as anything else, anything we could say. In fact, I'm actually proud of the United States of America for the lack of reaction we had to all of that. You know, political pundits complaining, us bitching and moaning, but nobody did anything. You know, one of the... Uh... Before Kyle Rittenhouse, that the the media and the narrative and the Antifa sympathizers tried to make hay about, there was a a major thing. I think they were prosecuted too. I I sh I don't know what happened to that case. I should follow up. But there were major riots in St. Louis. Remember, and there was a viral video of an uh um older middle aged couple coming out onto their front porch with guns in hand. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Uh, they never actually pointed the guns at anyone. They never fired a they shot. They were prosecuted, though. They were prosecuted, though, for wielding firearms. All they did was come out on the front porch and say, we will defend our, do not come onto our property. We will defend our property if you try and damage our property. Yeah, what was the charge? Assault with a deadly weapon? There, it was something way over the top. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know it if was, they it down or what pointing the gun at people was considered assault. Uh... And th that could have gone so much worse you know, multiple times over. Um, there was a lot of restraint, perhaps too much restraint, but that's a 
subject for another time. Yeah, and that's a delicate conversation because the answer is yes, but at the same time, you, you don't want to promote the reaction because the wrong people are going to be the first people to take action. And this that that that's the problem. It's it's the it's it's game theory. The the bad actors are going to be the yes. first to bad act. And uh if we say, well, you know what? Some of those people probably could have defended themselves there. Every person that wanted to pick a fight is going to take that as license to go. Well, and look what happened to Kyle Rittenhouse. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it there were a, there were a lot of people kind of on the fence about him probably, and if they would have charged him with something lesser, they might have gotten a conviction. But the charge, the justice, wasn't the point. Mm -hmm. the The action, the process, was the point. The process yeah, he, was the punishment, and it was the politics. And what they what they could have done is they could have got him on just manslaughter because of putting himself in that situation, just like getting in a car drunk would be putting yourself mm -hmm. in that situation and you kill somebody. Uh, that would have been something they probably could have pulled off, but they went for it all. Mm -hmm. And when they went for it all, they lost it all. It would Rightfully so, because he was defending himself. I've watched the video many, many, many times. Those people were assaulting him. And he's just a kid. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> even, even if he went too far, how many 17 year old kids go too far on almost everything they do? Yep. That's what, that's what it's like to be a 17 year old kid. Yeah. And, and that socking back to RFK jr. Here, here's mm -hmm. where it all connects and why it matters is it wouldn't matter to us in our daily individual lives if we didn't have the power of the federal government on one side of the narrative pushing it because if you didn't have a uh a deep state swamp bureaucratic byzantine nightmare of a federal government that could force you to do these things then it wouldn't matter. These people could yell and demonstrate all they want. They could think whatever they want. Heck, you can think RFK is an anti-vax nutcase, but you should still vote for him if you think he will legitimately constrain the federal bureaucracy because he can be an anti-vax nutcase all he wants, but what he's saying is the federal government should not have the power to force you one way or the other. Well, and, and I'm taking this as a scientist. Uh, there's a part of me that wants that whole industry cleaned up. Yeah. Because there's, if he does what he wants and he can get the legislature to go along with it, then science will be back in a situation where your research isn't dependent on an equity statement. Yeah. Or, 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 or funded because it fits a, a narrative or, or it, it helps a certain company come along. Or again, he is he is the most anti-fascist candidate we have right now. And from my research, and I'm not just watching hours of him, I'm watching everybody that come that pops up. The only one I haven't watched a lot of is Marianne Williamson because just the little bit I had of her was she was a female Bernie. And <laughs> you know, it's okay, that yeah. I, I can't go the socialist route. It, I'm I'm too much of a, I'm a business owner. I'm a capitalist in nature. Uh, so it's just, I haven't watched too much of her. I will watch a little bit more just to see if she's got other good ideas, you know, just in case she could like add intrigue to the mix, but I'm watching them all. And the other one that intrigues me the most is Vivek because Pence was pretty much exactly what I expected him to be. Uh, oh, yeah. DeSantis is, we've got enough exposure to him and he's, pretty much exactly what I expected to me. And Trump is Trump. You know, the, the only difference between Trump 2024 and Trump 2016 is going to be, we have a Trump that's out for revenge. Now you also and, have a record. That was one of the big red flags in 2016 is look, this guy doesn't have a record except in business. Yeah. He's, he's been vocal. He's been public. He's been on Oprah and Phil Donahue. And he, he has talked. And, and I I've mentioned this before. There was one core to Trump. There was one through line that you could count on because it was there since the 80s, which is 
America is getting screwed on these trade deals. We are screwing ourselves mm -hmm. for the people in power and big businesses to get richer, and it's not actually helping us. And, well, and, and, and uh, according to the uh, population collapse crowd, uh, his NAFTA restructuring is actually the thing that will save the U.S. It, it's also why two or three times uh, the party that came up around Perot, the Reform Party, mm -hmm. they tried to recruit him to run. Two or three times, and I actually liked a lot of the things the Reform Party had had going for it. Mm -hmm. I if if I had been, what year was that? Ninety two. Yeah, if I had been voting age, I probably would have voted for him that year. And then I think he ran again in ninety six, but by that point it was a joke. Yeah. Well, no, he was he was destroyed because he he was a threat to the Uniparty. Now, I disagree with that. I know no, that's I, no. Why there might be other him. things to it, but he showed that there was actually a vulnerability yes. to the yes. duopoly and but he what he wasn't he wasn't the candidate that we needed there there is and this is hard to talk about because people who supported perot were no but the but the reform kind of party ideals might have been what yes we needed. yes that, that's that's but, what i'm saying but perot was not the guy and that's my frustration with trump is you can think all these things these maga things but he's not your guy Perot was not your guy because remember what sunk Perot was going to win. He was going to be the first third party to actually win according to the polls. Anyway, he dropped out and then he got back in because what a lot of people don't realize is that Perot, the Perot family has a long standing feud with the Bush family. It is, it is classic old West Texan Hatfield and McCoy's feud. It is almost certain that the only reason Perot got into that race was to sink Bush's chances. Partly because of policy, but also almost certainly partly, if not mostly, because of personal animosity. And that is evidenced by the fact that he was winning and he dropped out. And then like two to four weeks later, I don't remember the timeline, he announced that he was back in. But of course, by then he'd lost half his support. Well, I would challenge... Every hardcore Trump supporter out there, every MAGA person, you know, die MAGA person out there, look into Vivek for a little bit mm -hmm. and you're going to see a lot of mirror image in ideology and in, uh, but a lot more understanding of the underpinnings of it. Uh, and yeah, just, just at least give that a chance. And I'm not just trying to pull Trump supporters away. So DeSantis wins, which is probably the most likely scenario if a lot of people look into that but at the same time he, he's he's got a lot of the same ideals he understands the the cei the dei the esg movements because like all RK, the, all the three three letter uh, names right now uh i mean he woke he wrote three books on it go by exactly. one, you know <laughs> it's uh but he also has a very nationalistic view and the way he describes it takes away all the fodder from the white nationalist mm -hmm. uh narrative because first of all he's indian uh but it's uh it, he believes in an american nationalism and this is something i've said before when you have a melting pot country nationalism is the thing that keeps you together because we it's, are going yeah. to have tribes and i would rather my tribe be united states then my tribe be black, white, Asian, Hispanic, because frankly, I can walk down the street in any direction and end up in somebody else's tribe. You know, I, I would rather my tribe be everything around me. I'm drawing a blank on his name. Uh, what is that guy's name? So this was um. One of the really disappointing things about the 2015-16 primary to me is Bobby Jindal. Same because Jindal. the the Indian guy, government, uh, Louisiana? governor of Louisiana. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. He's, he's funny because he talks like he's from Louisiana and he looks like, you know, the quickie mark guy. Uh, we're going to get banned for that. But. He's he is like that. Like it, also one Disclaimer, of the reasons Heath is our uh, color commentary. He is not our fact uh, yeah. based <laughs> color commentary. I see what you did there. Much like Nikki Haley, uh, is why I'm disappointed we're, in her. We're recently. only half evil. <laughs> but 
as children of immigrants, well, Ted Cruz is the same way. I and mean, he listened to his father, Rafael talk is they came from countries that kind of suck. Their, their parents came from countries that kind of suck. So they have a very deep appreciation for what America is, was, and could be. And, and that is where they're at their finest is when they're articulating that. Unfortunately, Jindal wasn't able to navigate the primary system as well as I'd hoped because before before I looked into Cruz, Jindal was my for, my pick for just at the very beginnings of the of the primary for 2016 in 2015. Looking at it from the outside, looking in before I started to dig too deep and became a Cruz guy, Jindal was my pick. Is I I liked what he had to say. I liked that he'd been a governor, so he was an executive, uh, but he just some people just aren't able to put it all together. And that's why I say I'm a DeSantis guy right now, but we'll see what happens if there's actually a debate and he cracks his pants or not. Mm -hmm. Let me let's let's go ahead and bring this uh, this portion to a close. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to say let's pause real quick for bathroom breaks and everything. And I want to bring up a clip from one of Kennedy's speeches in his town hall. Mm. It was his foreign policy. And he really kind of brings it together. And it uh, it was, to me, it was a little bit of a mic drop moment as much as he can get with his voice. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I think that'd be a good, good way to close it out. And I think we, uh, I wrote down, we were talking about Saul Alinsky and I want to kind of get back to that because that'll take us right to our pride stuff. Do we want to do that as a part two or do we want to just have one long video? I'm We're at an hour right and a half here. right now. Yeah, let's do a part two then. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to pause it now. We're going to do that. I'm going to get the right clip. We'll play the clip, and then we'll go into part two. All right, we're back. I wanted to get the right spot in this video uh, because uh, of all the things that are going on. We've, we've got the Ukraine. We've got all the COVID stuff and everything. He was kind of putting it all together, and this is his foreign policy speech during this uh this town hall meeting and uh there might be a little extra in this but uh i think it i think it 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 really brings home what we were kind of talking about and again i'm not focusing 100% on him but at the same time he's the most intriguing candidate to me so far oh shit forgot to share with sound it would sound okay, Bill Murray. We're, we're we're only 180 something episodes into this. We'll figure it out eventually. Yeah. So the 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 backdrop to this as he's going on is apparently there was a phone in his uncle's office or in his father's office that was a direct line to Khrushchev. And they were told never to pick up the phone because if they picked up the phone, Khrushchev would be on the other line. Uh, and that's the former Soviet Union. If we touched that, if we picked up that phone, Khrushchev was going to answer. And the wires from that phone are still sticking out of the of wall of my brother's house, which was at that time was the Summer White House. But they knew they had to talk to each other if they were going to save the world. They said, you know, the, that first letter from Khrushchev, he said, we're all on an arc. And, we, you know, we're, we, we can't build another one. The Earth. And to, to go into this, he was asked about uh, diplomacy. Mm -hmm. How would he be dealing with this situation? He was talking about open lines of communication is the number one thing. And the problem with Biden right now is he is completely shutting everybody out except this America first. No, not America first. It's actually true, true kind of nationalism, isolationism. It's, we're going to send our money these places. But uh, we're not going to communicate with anybody and try to de-escalate the situation at all. Well, to the to the opposite, there have been multiple reports where there were attempts to de-escalate. I, I think he, I think he yeah. talked about this on the Peterson podcast is there have been multiple reports that every attempt to de-escalate the U.S. and or NATO have shot it down. Earth is an arc and we need to we need to preserve it. And now, for our religious talks, that's an interesting analogy he called the earth the ark mm -hmm. and we were talking about uh metaphors in the, in the literature you 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 might have something there and... and the 
question now is, are we willing to do anything like that today? Or are we gonna remain stuck in a self-righteous story in which America is categorically good and our po opponents are irredeemably evil? If we remain stuck there, so will every other nation. It's not only America that's falling in, fallen into this simplistic good guy, bad guy thinking. That's the example we've set for everybody in the world. No wonder it's been replicated everywhere between Israel and Iran, between India and Pakistan, between Shia and Sunni, between Jew and Arab, between Hindu and Muslim, left and right, between pro-life and pro-choice, between vax and anti-vax. This tribalistic, us versus them thinking is tearing us apart. And it's... Yeah, pause there. Okay. Yeah. That, that that was the the bring it the home moment because he took this foreign policy thing and then took it right to right in our front yard yeah because yeah. because it is all connected it's it's that 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 Saki's all the way back to where I started with him which is mm, this thing that he said that I but that shows that he does get it he just thinks about it differently because mm -hmm. that's talking about the the ideology that's talking about the way we're thinking and the way we're acting and why this all connects it's how we end up going on so many tangents with every political thing we talk about because it is connected to other other things because it is about how how we're we as regular people are thinking how we're acting or reacting as we've talked about a lot today and and then how that impacts multiple issues all right. Well, we're going to take this into a part two. So if you want to stick around for both, click on the next video uh, to kind of summarize this in a little bit of a nutshell. Uh, look at your primary voting system in your state. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming most people that watching this would be from Texas. We're open primary. So you choose one, no matter what you're registered as. Uh, but uh, yeah, and then just kind of look at the lay of the land. We're super Tuesday. So there's not going to be a whole lot of information coming in mm -hmm. as far as who's leading uh, other than just what New Hampshire and Iowa before that. Uh, there were several, but I, I think it's five or six before that. Yeah. And, but also as he pointed out, delegates matter. So just because they don't win everything in the state doesn't mean they don't get something right on the and, Democrat side. Yeah. Yeah. So uh so so yeah, uh, we 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 did harp on RFK a lot, which again, to to my point, he's a, just a very extremely intriguing candidate, and he mm -hmm. brings things to the table that the other candidates need to be addressing, and yes. that that's that's the major thing. Uh, and God, on the Dem side, please not another four years of Biden, and uh, and not a half a year of Biden, and then three and a half years of Kamala because he's digressing so fast. So, uh, we'll, we'll kind of pivot to other social issues in part two. Uh, they will be relevant to what we've talked about, but, uh, completely different. Yeah. And if, you know what, if you want us to do this same kind of focus on another one of the candidates, you know, let us know who you're interested in and we'll, I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to do this because I, like I said, I was, I was listening to RFK on Peter. I'd heard him on other platforms before, but listening to his full interview with Peterson and Peterson let him talk a lot. And there were things I really liked things I was really concerned about. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can, Which do you can get that full that interview on Twitter right now. You can't get it okay. on YouTube, but you can get it on Twitter. Uh, but RFK on, I listened to it on Peterson's uh, podcast. Uh, so it was. Oh yeah, it was you can up. get it on Spotify. The, aud the audio was was up fully. Yeah. Yeah, you can get it on Spotify. RFK on Rogan is on Spotify. That's three hours of 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 talk. So the one of the main points here is again circle back to our first defenses of Trump when we were like, please quit making me defend this guy. Mm -hmm. Is are you talking about what he said or what the press said he said? Mm -hmm. And that's the main thing with RFK right now, because the press is funded and two tappers response of this, this conspiracy theory of, <laughs> of funding to the news organizations affecting how we report on it. No, it is exactly why you're not reporting on this mm -hmm. 70 some odd percent of your money comes from these companies. 
Uh, and this guy is coming in saying he's going to remove that. And your marketing departments are going to have to get on the phone with every truck, car, uh, company in the country, every you know sports sneaker company in the country to try to fill in those gaps. And nobody's mm -hmm. got the money that pharma has. Oh, pharma yeah. is the biggest industry in the country. Yeah. All right. Well, that ends up our ramblings for that first topic. And we'll try and keep the second part a little quicker.